My name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times. My guest today is Michelle Dunmarsh. Michelle is co-founder of Minor Matters Books and previously worked at Aperture Foundation and Chronicle Books, and she was the executive director of Photo Center Northwest in Seattle. She's edited or designed more than 100 publications and curated a number of significant exhibitions. So please welcome Michelle Dunmarsh. Welcome. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for starting off your, your Monday and here in the United States, your Martin Luther King Day with, uh, with this conversation. Um, John, should I go ahead and just kind of launch into a little bit of an overview and then we can yeah, dive that'd in? Yeah, that'd be great. The way to go? Fantastic. Sure. All right. We'll get the formalities out of the way so we can <laughs> just talk. All right, so I'm just gonna um, try and go through relatively quickly a little bit about my background in photography and some of the projects that I've been engaged in and a little bit about um, our publishing platform through Minor Matters. <clears throat> my entry into the world of photography really came through publishing and uh, I taught graphic design at Seattle Central Community College and, and came into photography as a graphic designer. So. Um, I'm always interested in visual ways of conveying uh, information and a while ago landed on these kind of logos and building icons as a, a quick snapshot that takes you through almost 50 years of, of my life. Um, I grew up south of Seattle, Washington um, in a, a farming town called Puyallup. I don't know if John's going to show my Studebaker at some point in time, but we can <laughs> talk about life in Puyallup if anyone has questions about that. Very proud of, of where I grew up and am glad to have grown up in that kind of environment. Uh, headed east to Bard College, uh, which I did not visit before I went there. So it was a little bit of a leap and an adventure, but I'd never been to the East Coast and it seemed worth trying. There were a lot of photographs of people uh, reading books, sitting under trees. And I thought, if this is college, <laughs> I'm, I'm in. I totally want to sit under really beautiful trees and read books. Um, I actually learned that Frank Ockenfelds Jr. shot the campaign that drew me to Bard College. So yes. it's his fault for everything that comes <laughs> next. Um, I went to graduate school in New York City on a strange um, find your own graduate program 3-2 option through Bard called the professional option. I became very interested in graphic design while I was studying literature and art history at Bard. I was working in the college publications office um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so found my way to Pace University who had a graduate program in the business of publishing, um, which brought me to New York City, at the beginning of what would have been my senior year of college, um, finished my graduate degree, worked for a couple of different companies, but the main ones as John mentioned are here eventually came back to Seattle, continued working for Aperture, uh, came back to Seattle and stayed in Seattle, seven years at Photographic Center Northwest, simultaneous with the founding of Minor Matters. So that's the quick snapshot, and uh, we'll go through some of that in a little more, um, a little more detail. I can't always tell when I've frozen. So hopefully you all will tell me if Yeah, I you're have. still still there. I see your mouse moving on the screen. Okay, good. So my life in photography is about wor working with photographs more so than about taking pictures. I don't I don't make pictures. Um what I do with my iPhone, I don't call making pictures or even taking pictures. I just mm -hmm. call them captures. Um but I've had the great privilege of working with great photographers primarily through publications, but also through public programs and through exhibitions. Um, this is a little installation that was the basis for a book that I'm working on right now called Seen Being Seen. So this was at the Highland Heritage Museum in Burien, where they asked me to put together an installation of my life in photography, including prints by photographers that I'd worked with um, and a selection of publications that I had worked on. 
And whose photographs are those in the picture? Let's see. This is Carrie Mae Weems. This is Jim Marshall. This is Graham Nash. Uh, this is a photograph of me by Stephen Shore. Sorry, Stephen, the different Stephen Shore. Um, when I graduated from college, this is a portrait of me by Sylvia Plahi. This is a portrait of me by Will Wilson, um, who's a Navajo artist who I hope to do a book with someday. This is uh, Jean Richards. This one's a little hard to see, but it's a daguerreotype by Eric Johnson and Daniel Carrillo here in Seattle that came out of a residency we started at PCNW. Oh, yes. This is Minor White. Uh, above is Paul Berger. Um, this is Sylvia Plahi, Swan's Way. This one, which is really hard to see from the reflection, is Mary Ellen Mark. Oh. Uh, and this is an Edward Steichen. Oh, wonderful. What a it collection. Was, uh, quite a challenge to figure out how to tell what has been this journey in 11 to 14 photographs. I have expanded in the book. It's probably the main reason the book is even happening because I felt so bad leaving Paul Strand out as a print, though he's represented in a book that are, are these the whole, all your the whole project just had to expand from there. Uh, are those all your images? Those are all photographs I live with okay. by other people. And then the books below are all projects that I've either designed or edited or published. That's a wonderful collection of everything. Thank you. Um, so I mentioned Bard and I have to really give credit to the publications office. I did an internship uh, basically for two years working in the college publications office. And the woman who ran it, Ginger Shore, um, had worked with, with uh, Steichen at Forbes magazine and, and had worked with Walker Evans and just had a brilliant eye when it came to publications and the use of art photography in publications. Um, she and Stephen Shore are married. He was the head of the photo department. She was running publications. And so she would do things like bring in portfolios by amazing photographers. This is a William Wegman. Um, she used Wynne Bullock to interview a science story. Uh, she featured Cindy Sherman, who had nothing to do with Bard, but she just thought the Bard community needed to know who Cindy Sherman was. So she ran a portfolio in the alumni magazine. She was very bold in her um, choices through the agency that she had as a uh, as director of the office. And this, uh, this was the alumni magazine at the time. And this issue in particular was very important because it was my kind of lightning rod moment. I was doing the most important thing that interns do. I was getting coffee and bagels for the women of the office. And I came in to a discussion uh, with the art director and the director, the editor and the graphic designer about whether or not the word Annandale, the title of the magazine, should be the same hue, a darker hue, or a brighter hue than the overall kind of orange background in the photograph. And they talked about this for an hour. <laughs> and I was completely riveted. I'd never heard a conversation like that. And it felt like I was just being led into uh, a world um, that was new and exciting. And, and I was hooked. I was like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what you call this, but whatever this is, I wanna, I wanna keep doing this. And as somebody who'd been studying literature to understand that design had such an effect on how people perceive information um, was really profound. And so I learned a lot. I, was taken on press. I did photo shoots with them. That's how I met Charlie Harbit. Um, I, I just was exposed to a lot through those women. Um, in addition to things like if you have a black turtleneck and a black pleated skirt and a pair of pearl earrings, there's nowhere in the world you can't be. Um, so the lessons were really definitely beyond just graphic design, photography. I feel the same way. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. I know. Um, I, sorry, this, there's two pictures in here that didn't link correctly, and so they're a little pixely, but um, as John mentioned, I spent 15 years of my life at Aperture in a variety of different roles. Um, 
my introduction to them was really at Bard. Uh, Larry Fink had been published by Aperture, Stephen Shore had been published at Aperture, and so there were Aperture books in the college bookstore uh, because of the faculty who'd been published by them. And it was the first time that I, I held a book and I was looking at the paper and I was looking at ink and I was just smelling it. And um, so I was familiar with, with the name and my first semester in graduate school, one of my professors was the head of production at Aperture, Stephen Barron. And I was the nerdy kid sitting in the front row and his class was on a Friday night. And so my friends were like, oh my gosh, can we please just like be done and get some food and a bottle of wine? And I'd be like, I'll be right there. I have one more question. And, um, and so that was the beginning of a, a 14 year friendship with Steve. He eventually hired me as a design associate at Aperture. Um, so I started as a, as a graphic in-house graphic designer, um, working on issues of the magazine, working on uh, invitations to gallery openings, setting, setting type for postcards, whatever needed to be done. And it was also really, uh, I was mainly hired because they had in 1996 just acquired the first Macintosh computer in-house. And most of the graphic designers didn't use computers and didn't know how to use it. So I was really brought in just to be some hands for some smarter, more brilliant eyes and as a result of that, I got to learn from those brilliant eyes um, and, and bring those things into what was then a new, a new technology. Um, I went on to become the co-publisher of the magazine, the deputy director of the foundation, blah, 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 a few other things. Um, I spent about two years with Chronicle Books in San Francisco, uh, commuting from Seattle. So Jane, I relate to, to going back and forth. I was doing that every week. Um, these are just a selection of some of the projects I acquired. I kind of jumped ship uh, from having a background mostly in design to being an editor at Chronicle. And so if people have questions about the difference in the hierarchy of publishing, I can tell you quickly that editors are considered more important than designers uh, in trade publishing. And uh, <clears throat> though I, of course, started as a designer, so I don't necessarily subscribe to that. Um, it was a very important learning experience. By means of comparison, Aperture produced 20, at the most 30 titles, including reprints a year. Chronicle produced uh, over 200 titles a year, sometimes up to 500 titles a year. So it was a, it was a huge shift in scale. Chronicle is one of the largest independently owned uh, book publishers in the United States. Um, and they, I started working there uh, in 2008. So for those of you who have followed the American economy, that was like right smack in the middle of the recession. Um, it was not a great time to go to work for a commercial publisher that wanted art books that made money. Um, but it was certainly an educational process. And I, Minor Matters would not have come into being um, without the time that I, that I spent at Chronicle. Again, sorry, bad link. Um, Jim Marshall was a very important author at Chronicle. He is one of the most important music photographers, uh, I think in the United States. I really consider him the kind of godfather of that as a genre. And um, Jim was my standing date. I had dinner with him uh, every Tuesday when I was in San Francisco and I learned an enormous amount from him about everything. Um, and I miss him. He's been gone for 10 years and I miss him every single day. Minor matters. So having spent a fair amount of time in um, nonprofit publishing and then also in trade and commercial publishing, uh, I started to see that there were, there were projects that were not moving forward uh, that were books that I, I wanted to own. Um, either the photographers had a very high bar in terms of the level of quality that they desired and they, they wanted something that looked like an Aperture book, um, but it was difficult to raise money to produce to that level. Um, publishers were looking for projects, but they didn't necessarily want to invest that much money into the projects. And if those books weren't printed really well, then they weren't going to reach the correct audience. And so there was this kind of 
gap. And I started thinking about how one could perhaps fill that gap. It was also a period of time where there was a big, so this is sort of 2010, 2011. Um, there was a big push for the DIY movement. There was a lot of interest in journaling and publishing journals and crafting and everything was about doing it yourself. And I thought, well, all these people are self-publishing who actually don't know anything about publishing. And I do know something about publishing. So I should maybe think about making use of what I know. And it took a number of fits and starts. The, the first concept uh, under a different name was in 2011. And I figured out that I would need $25,000 to launch and I didn't have $25,000. So I put the Excel files and the scraps of paper with the ideas on it back into a folder and stuck it back into a drawer. And then in 2012, I pulled it back out again and um, had a few conversations with people. And the most important thing to the launch of Minor Matters and what has continued to be important to the continuation of Minor Matters uh, is one that I realized as much as this was a publishing venture, it was also an e-commerce business. So I needed someone who understood e-commerce as much as I understood book publishing. And I'll explain a little bit about our business model and why that was so important. But that decision led me to a former student of mine and a friend of mine um, who became my business partner in the development of Minor Matters. So how we've gone about publishing books. We work um, often with single authors, although one of the projects that I'm showing you here is a book that I'm that is about my own story in photography um, that does have uh, photographs by 30 different photographers. Um, Nicholas Galanin, a book that's also in pre-sales, is not only a single author, it is a single project that will be realized in book form. But we develop these projects, um, work through what the physicality of the book will be, estimated page count, who might be writing for them. And then we launch them on our website for a maximum three to six month period of time with the goal of pre-selling a minimum of 500 copies. And if we are successful in selling those copies, we move the book into production and we physically produce it. And if we don't, then we don't. If we cannot find a base audience for the book, we don't produce the book. All of the people who buy the book during the pre-sales period are named within the book. Um, and they are our co-publishers. So we really believe in the philosophy of creating books together. The buying audience is a collaborator with us in the creation um, of our books. And I can answer questions about that if people have more questions. Um, that's a great philosophy. Thank you. So we launched in 2013. We now have 20 books in print. Um, we have a number of titles that are not books that we developed that did not um, successfully find their audience. Um, we're still proud of having tried to make books with those people. But um, so this, this is from, this slide is from a talk uh, that I, a conversation that I was a part of um, last fall. And I had said to John, I, I want to talk a little bit about the issue of representation for women, um, for lesser represented communities in the arts and our society. So I've just organized, these are, these are out, all of our titles up to 2018, but sort of organized by demographic. So in the United States, loosely, 50% uh, of the population identifies as female or was born as a female. Um, and about one in every four people is not entirely Caucasian. If you, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking about issues of, uh, you know, what it means to sort of usher people forth into the world in a, in a manner of equity. But that, those numbers um, have become my clearest shortcut. Like, look around your life. Do you see 
an equal balance of men and women in every sector of your life? Probably not, but that's something to think about. Do you see one in four people not being uh, exclusively Caucasian? Maybe yes, maybe we know. Obviously, that's going to vary a little bit depending on what city you're in, but those are average numbers. And so those that is a kind of loose um, but important element to the books that we publish. So if we're publishing four to five books in a year, at least two of them should be with women. If we're publishing um, four or five books in a year, at least one to two of them should be people who are African American, Latina, um, Native American, mixed race, coming from coming from different backgrounds. Um, also looking at issues of the LGBTQ community, and and so keeping that as a part of the voices that we feel it's important for us to be considering. What that often means when I'm developing projects. And this is just the reality. I have a list of 15 um, Caucasian men between the ages of 35 and 70 who have very meaningful projects that they would like us to publish. And for every four of those, we make sure three of those, we are doing one by somebody who's not that demographic. And uh, we really make an effort to, to stick to that. Um, these are the most recent books. Uh, these, are our, these are our pandemic babies right here. All of these books uh, were launched. These three books were launched um, in February, March of 2020 and managed to find their pre-sales audience, which still feels like a little bit of a miracle, uh, but is wonderful. Um, the very first book here, the smaller one, The Unconcerned Photographer with, with Charlie Harbit, this was a, a little bit of an um, experiment. This is an essay book, and it's a book that we tried print on demand. So we did not run it through our traditional pre-sales process. We just made it and offered it for sale. Um, but because we did a print on demand, it was a much lower financial investment. Um, I love that book. And John uh, was part of a panel that we did with the Palm Springs Photo Festival. Um, about yeah, I, just, I just put a link to a recording of that in the chat. Oh, great. Um, so that book certainly has not been um, a financial success by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm, I'm, super, I'm super proud of it. Can I ask a question at this point? Yeah, yeah. Michael. <clears throat> the other three books in the previous uh, slide, were the other three books financially successful? Well, that kind of remains to be seen, but they all, well, this one definitely has. India Beale's book continues to sell really well, um, and I'm already considering uh, when we may need to do a reprint just because uh, it's it's selling really well. That's the fantasy of what should be happening. Um, Jocelyn Lee's book, Sovereign, which I think was a very important book for us to do. These are um, nudes of women over 50 in the landscape. I didn't expect that to be a bestseller. I did it because I believe that it's important. I believe that it's important uh, in terms of how women are perceived. Um, and that's something that was important to that photographer. So it sold enough to get published. Um, I don't have huge expectations for that. Isn't that similar to what Joyce Tennyson and um, Annie Leibovitz did? Annie Leibovitz has done a lot of photographs of her of her mother, certainly, as she aged. Um, and Joyce Tennyson has done some of that. Jocelyn's is really more figure-based than portrait-based. Um, and I could be wrong. It could certainly find a much broader audience. But thus far, it has been something that people say, yeah, that's really important. But it has not been the same kind of financial commitment to people actually buying it. One last um, question on this. I'm sorry? If you, one last question on this. If you were to factor out the pre-sold 
money that people sent in, would any of these books have reached their goal? Well, the goal is pre-sale. So I guess I don't fully understand your question. Like I can't factor out that because that that is the goal. The pre-sales numbers are the goal. Well, I would assume that the pre-sales goal just assures that there's enough money in the pot to do the publication. It's not press. just about money though. It's about audience. It's about determining if there's an audience of people for the book. Having worked in the nonprofit sector for many, most of my career, it's getting money. You can, you can find four people who will each put in $5,000 and you will have the money. That's not the same thing as a project having an audience. And the making of uh, offset printed books is complicated and um, environmentally, perhaps not the most efficient process, although everybody has worked very hard in printing to be to be more environmentally sensitive. Um, but it's it's a big it's an it's an investment on multiple levels. And what happens so, to the what happens to the books that you are remandered? Well, we we don't remainder books. So all the we don't remainder get, books. So all the books get sold or destroyed? We don't, we don't need to destroy books because we only produce books that have demonstrated that they have an audience. So it's, it's a little bit different from traditional publishing, right? We, we, are, we are front loading the information. We have done the R&D in real time in public to see if there's an audience and if there's not an audience, we don't we don't make the book. Does that make sense? So I just have some, one or two more slides degree. here, and yeah. then I'll I'll cut out of the screen sharing so I can actually see your faces as we're having <laughs> these conversations. And um, one of the things we found is that there's a there's a lot of people who are interested in being published, and so we've. Um, talked with a couple of other small publishers uh, and put together book pitch yourbookpitch.com which is a consulting service that really breaks down for people uh, on your specific project what is the direction that based on our professional experience would be the right one for you to bring a book into the world so maybe that will be through a print on demand environment Maybe that will be going to a commercial publisher and understanding the financial investment that may be requested of you in that process and the whys of that um, reality. Maybe something that gets realized through through us or through another publisher. Um, so we just we had just soft launched this uh, in February last year when things kind of shut down. So this is certainly something that I will be spending a little more time on in 2021. Um, we have had some photographers and other artists participate, um, but I, I am excited about the opportunities through this, particularly during a period of time when in-person portfolio reviews are less likely, this is a chance to, to, to work with people in a consulting manner um, and give them feedback on how to make their book actually happen in a way that's cost effective. And because I've talked far longer than I intended to, just last uh, quickly, John mentioned, I've also done some curation. Um, many of those have related to book projects that I've done. So this is an installation at the Bronx Museum of the Arts of one of our um, early books in 2014, Lisa Leone. Uh, these are two installation shots from exhibitions at Photographic Center Northwest. And lastly, um, two different views of a major exhibition in 2018 from a 2016 Minor Matters book called All Power, Visual Legacies of the Black Panther Party. And now I will stop sharing. <laughs> that was and great. Now I can tell you. Yeah, you, you, you covered a lot of the things I was going to ask you about. Uh, but I want to thank you for being here on Martin Luther King Day uh, and talking about representation uh, I was going to bring up the un 
Gun Concern Photographer, which you already did, and I put a link to the discussion from the Palm Springs Photo Festival. How did you get involved with Palm Springs and Jeff Dunas? That's a great question. Um, I designed Jeff's book, State of the Blues, uh, okay. which was a publication through Aperture that came out in 1998. So I met him early part of 1997. Uh, Jeff and I did not get along. I had a binder. He was in LA. I was in New York. I'm in the office. And I, for a long time, I don't think I have it anymore, but I had a, a folder that had a stack of correspondence like this, that was just disagreements between Jeff Dunas and I. Uh, and the editor of the book kind of threw up his hands. He was like, you're both too stubborn. I, you know, I understand about 50% of what you're arguing about. Um, but when the book was completed, the exhibition opened at the Delta Blues Museum in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And so I got sent by Aperture, which was a great privilege to go be at the opening and help the kind of final elements of the installation and spending time with Jeff and with his wife, um, listening to amazing blues music and seeing people really respond to this incredible body of work that he'd made, uh, smooth things over a little bit. And uh, then when I started the Aperture West program, when I was traveling a lot to LA, Jeff was one of the most important uh, proponents and champions and he knew everyone in LA and he took me by the hand and he just introduced me to everybody, museum directors, collectors, gallerists, um, photographers. It was like our disagreements just melted away and he is one of my best friends. He is very much um, in my, my photo family. And, uh, and so when he, he had talked about for years wanting to do something in the United States that was similar to Arles. And uh, he'd spent a lot of time in France. He and his wife lived in France for many years. And when he found um, a location in Palm Springs, there was, he had dinner, a dinner at his house and there were maybe six of us. Um, Amy Quadler and Dan Milner were there. Dennis Keeley, who just retired from Art Center was there. There were just a couple of us and he was like, okay, are we like, is everybody in? Cause it's gonna take all of us to make this work. And that first year, I think there were 200 people, uh, 2005 at the, at the photo festival. I was, it was so hot that I would jump in the pool between portfolio reviews. Cause we were outside with little wow. umbrellas around us. And I would just like dip in the pool and then come back out and throw a caftan on and sit down and do the next portfolio review. Um, so it has certainly evolved in <laughs> its 15 years, uh, but it's it's been an incredible thing to be a part of. And Jeff has always made a place for me um, to talk about ideas, to talk about photographers that maybe were a little bit off the beaten track. And I'm very grateful to him for that. Yeah, I think my first year at Palm Springs was 2017. And the day I flew in, it dropped from 105 to 85 and stayed 85 for the week and then went back up after I left. So I didn't get that first initial experience of Palm Springs till the second year. And, and then it came back with the yeah. vengeance, huh, John? <laughs> yeah, then we went out to, um, what is it, the Salton Sea for a day and to Joshua Tree and got, got the full heat there. Uh, Julie Corcoran was asking how you came up with the name Minor Matters, and I was going to ask you about how you came up the whole company. You talked a little bit about it, though. So, yeah, the beginning was really how how can we make books that aren't being made, and um, and Julie, I, I will answer this a little longer than I usually do because you're in Ireland. Uh, my 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 paternal grandmother, Anastasia Walsh, uh, was an intrepid woman. I did not know her. She died before I was born, um, but she served in the, in the Army Corps of Nurses. Uh, she won her passage fare to America, betting on a horse from Kilkenny, cut school that day and because the nuns wouldn't let her go to the racetrack. And so my, uh, my initial venture was called Stacia's Landing. Um, because I had this dream about like a lake and a dock and 
taking off from there. And I thought this was the greatest name in the world. And I was so excited to take Stacia's Landing out into the world. And I designed my logo. And I went to a portfolio review. I had business cards made. I went to a portfolio review and people sat down and they held up the card and they were like, shh, what, what's the name of your business? And I was like, oh, that's, that's not gonna work. Stacia is not a name people know in the United States of America. And, and so it was a little heartbreaking. I had the concept all worked out, but I was very attached to this name. And I didn't really know what to do, except I knew the name that I'd chosen was, was not gonna work. And so I kind of went back to the drawing board and was thinking about, uh, in all transparency, I had parted ways uh, with Aperture after 15 years in a rather abrupt manner. And I was a little bit mad at them. Um, so there was a, a little bit of a um, poke in, in minor matters, referencing the spiritual nature of minor whites and what he believed in photography and what he brought to photography that I did not feel was being honored by my, my colleagues um, who had chosen to no longer have me at the company. Um, but it also had to do with the notion of minority. And that's not something, that's not a word that we use a lot. It's not a popular word in America. But um, when you grow up in Puyallup and your mother is an immigrant from Burma, and your father's family is Irish, the Irish part people kind of get, the Burmese part people kind of exotify. And at a certain point in Puyallup, they kind of don't care. Like if you know how to ride a horse and feed chickens, um, it's fine. You grew up there, That's it's a small town. And so there's a certain sort of acceptance that happens in a small town that wouldn't necessarily happen in, in other places. But I, I don't look like everybody else in the room. Um, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. It occasionally gets pointed out to me. I occasionally point it out to other people. But when, when I had the opportunity or was pushed into the opportunity of starting something on my own, speaking from a place of maybe voices that are a little bit on the fringe and people whose work isn't always getting seen and sometimes that's just about being being in Seattle and not being in LA or Chicago or New York, um, or being in Puyallup and not even being in Seattle. Um, so thinking about what it means to look a little bit outside of perhaps what is happening in, in the mainstream. And so I tried a bunch of different words. I, I like any brainstorming process and I, wanted it to be something that made it seem important, but I also wanted it to be something that was a little bit tongue in cheek. And my greatest concern was actually because you could perceive minor matters as something that is diminutive, I was worried that photographers might not want to be published under that name. And so I went out to a lot of um, photographers that I knew and said, would this seem disrespectful? Like, would you feel like, oh, I don't want to be published by, by somebody who's saying I'm unimportant. Um, and there were one or two people who said, yeah, you run, you run the risk of that perception. But 30 people said, I think it's fine. Um, and because of my long relationship with Aperture and people knew that Minor White was somebody I really respected, the immediate read for a lot of people was minor matters. You, you understand that minor matters. Um, and so I was fortunate in that simply through my association with Aperture, that was a first read for a lot of people. Cool. Jeff, she was asking in the chat, in general, how is the art book market doing? Do uh, you have thoughts on big publishers like Tashin and small publishers like yourselves? How do you small publishers compete? I, I'm not competing with Tashin. I mean, the, those are different. Those are different markets, and so I think that's that's an important starting point. 
Um, Photo District News, which was a great publication that sadly uh, is no longer, in 2013, they, they sort of um, put up a headline that was like, Steidel, these little guys called Minor Matters, David and Goliath. I was like, I'm not competing with Steidel. He has his own print printer. Like, I don't have a Heidelberg Press sitting in the next building. I so wish I did. Um, I don't, publishing it is, is certainly independent publishing is not about competition. Like we all find, we're all friends with each other. We all find our niches. We want everyone to succeed. We want there to be more books. If you love books, you just want there to be more of them. And so I don't really see it as competition. I see we've, we've focused on a niche market, which is in understanding that selling less than 500 books uh, does not allow me to produce books the way that I want to produce them. And so there are other people who don't have the same kind of production um, fetishes, maybe I would say. Uh, they don't need something to be printed in duotone or on a coated paper or on a paper of a particular weight. Um, I trained with the production director at Aperture, so that was important to me. And I maintain those standards. Um, but that's not super important to other people. So I, I need a larger bucket of money to start with than some other publishers may deem important to them. We've never printed more than 2,000 copies of a book in, in, a, in an initial printing. Chronicle wouldn't even start looking at a project if they couldn't print seven to 10,000 copies. Toshin is gonna be looking at more like 10 and up. Doesn't um, all of this depend upon content? It's not just content, Michael. I think it's it's audience. You know, I mean, when you're when you're well, how do you get the audience if you don't have the content from the cover all the way through from the first page to the last? Well, you know, I just uh, I just bought a book because a student of mine edited it and I wanted to support him. And they are photographs of the club scene in New York in the early 90s, which is when I moved to New York City. Um, those photographs are not what I would find the most interesting. If I had edited that book, it would probably be a different book uh, because the young man who did it was more interested in the celebrities who were there, which is, <clears throat> probably what a publisher thought was going to sell. For me, I was more interested in the architecture of the clubs because I didn't take pictures. None of us were taking pictures in those clubs uh, with very few exceptions, except this you know, photographer who was there. And so saying it's, it's good content or less good content is the driving factor. It's, it's a variety of factors. So when we're looking at projects, we're looking at Okay, who who's the person making the pictures? First of all, who is their viewpoint? Who who are they? Like, who are they as a as a person? Um, and what is their track record? For our model, we found somebody has to have made work for a while, even if it's their first book. So India Beale is a great example. We published her first book, but she's she's been making work that has received national attention for nearly a decade. So we can look at that and say, okay, this person has gotten a lot of press coverage from the New York Times to PDN to different websites to the British Journal of Photography. There's an odd, there is a potential audience that's out there, right? So, the, wait a minute. so before you go on, let me, let me just say some, something else. <clears throat> so the, there's, there, are, there are two types of photographers. Only two? <laughs> uh, only two. <clears throat> there's the there's the young photographer or the old photographer that really is not known, hasn't been published, hasn't had galleries, and then there's the second photographer that has been published up the wazoo, has galleries, and is known by everybody. Does that mean that the 
young photographer or the old photographer that hasn't been widely seen produce worse images than the other photographer? Well, I guess that's why I'm saying it's not simply about it's not simply about the image. It's not simply about this person has made great images, therefore we will be able to publish a book with them. And that, I'm glad you're raising that. That is precisely where one of the exciting things about publishing is the opportunity through print on demand environments where you can make 20 copies of something or 50 copies of something and it can be, you can hold a hardcover book or a paperback book or whatever it is that you envision. You can hold that of your but who pay, work. But who pays for that? In that case, probably you. Me, the photographer? You, the, well, yes. And the reason that I say print on, envir print on demand environment is because I don't think it's an unreasonable investment to spend $2,500 to hold a hardcover book and have 50 copies of it. I do think it's unreasonable to spend $30,000 to $40,000 to hold a hardcover book that has your images in it. Because the likelihood that you are going to earn back $30,000 is highly unlikely. And then you have storage of the books. And I'm not, not even talking about storage of the books. I'm talking so, straight cash so financial investment. You mean thirty thousand dollars is too much to own twenty five copies of the book? It's you know it depends. Look, it depends on the person. I have worked with private clients for whom money is no object, mm -hmm. and they're not looking to sell something. They just want the best possibly produced version of something that they are doing. And that's fine. My issue is with very hardworking photographers who love the medium, who have invested their lives in making pictures, who take out a second mortgage if they're happy, if they're lucky enough to own a home, right? Who take the only inheritance they may have received, who take out a bank loan. And all of these are real scenarios. Mm -hmm. And point? sell their firstborn also. Who, who have done this in order to publish because it is expensive. And so publishers are not making larger publishers to go back to, I'm sorry, I can't remember who had asked an earlier question about this, but larger publishers are saying, we will keep making these books, but there aren't enough people buying them to justify our making the investment. So if you're willing to make the investment, Great. Question so on this. Daylights, daylight books, okay. care of log. I mean, it's easier to name the publishers that aren't going to ask you for money than to name the ones that are, because the majority, the majority of publishers are at this point saying they're going to call it a subvention. They're going to call it an investment. They're going to call it a variety of things, but there is an expectation that you will come to the table with twenty to thirty thousand dollars, in order for your book to be produced. So our model, and it's why we don't do too many books a year, right? Because our model is not easy either. Selling five hundred books is not easy. I sent out an email to fifty people this weekend who are targeted people, and that resulted in five sales, and that was pretty good. That was a pretty good response. <laughs> Every week I'll be setting out to 50 people. And if I get five, you know, so it's, it's, it's not an easy process, but I'm okay with people putting in sweat equity. I'm not okay with people being in a debt that they're never going to get out of. I feel the same way about graduate school, but that's a different story. <laughs> Ian, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes. To one of your points, an example, and then a question. Uh, I had an acquaintance who um, self-published a book. Uh, he um, uh, had it done in China. He, the cost to him was $60 each. He did a thousand of them. Mm. And it was indeed from an inheritance. Um, it was very, he did not consider his audience. And so it 
sold very poorly. Um, it sold really just amongst a very small audience. So I'm sure they have long since rotted in his garage. So, um, uh, so it was, um, he, he was happy to have a book. Um, at what point, let me ask a question, at what point uh, beyond the 500 copies uh, for Minor Matters, would you consider sales, uh, how many copies uh, would, in what period of time would make a successful book uh, as best as it could be financially for you and the photographer? Thank you, that's a great question. And the interesting thing about our model is that I looked at all the places where we could save money, right? So not hiring a distributor, not paying a warehouse. So we manage our own distribution. Um, profitability starts at the sale of a thousand copies. So we run our pre-sales process, we gauge there are books that that cross the threshold by the skin of a lot of people's teeth, right? We see that during the period of time. Okay, there's a strong commitment. People want this, but we're if we sell 20 copies beyond the 500 copies, that would be surprising. So great, we, we see that in the process. The photographers all get um, 100 copies of the book for any book that moves forward because I recognize and have seen over the years, what photographers need is the book, right? They need to be able to give it away if they want to, they need to be able to sell it if they're giving a talk, they need, they need the books, that, that's the most valuable thing for them. And so we do pay royalties on sales over a thousand copies because at a thousand copies, it becomes profitable. And so when we are making a profit, we wanna share that with our authors. Um, but there are books that don't, we don't print a thousand copies of them because it has clearly shown in the pre-sales process, those books are going to be sitting in a warehouse. So we may print 700, 750, the 500 go out to the people who bought them. The photographer gets their hundred copies. We keep a little bit of inventory and we call, we call that a day. I had a, I have a friend uh, who you well know, uh, who got his, essentially his start at the Palm Springs Photo Festival, who went on and had quite a bit of success uh, at this point in time, who went on to uh, do a book with you. Um, and I was quite surprised he didn't reach 500 copies. Uh, Me too. Yeah, <laughs> Me so too. we're talking about the same person. Yeah, I was totally shocked. You know, that was an interesting scenario, Ian, and it's it's important for us, like our last, I think it's been, I think, it, I think it's been uh, since 2016 that we have not, we have not achieved the goal. And there's a little bit of a um, challenge for me as a publisher when this is our stated goal to say like, okay, if we're making it every time, does that just mean I've gotten smarter and I'm only making great choices? Well, that's one way to look at it. You could also look at it as I'm not taking enough risk. I'm not taking on projects that, that aren't going to achieve that. And it's probably a little bit of both, right? Um, and so I have to push myself a little bit to say, okay, it's possible that this won't succeed, but you know what? It's got a fighting chance. Let's give it a fighting chance. So we, we have a project coming up that is landscape work. Um, not something I've done a lot of uh, for a variety of reasons. And, but it's important work. And this person doesn't have the they don't have a gallery. They don't have a strong collecting base. They haven't gotten a ton of press. They aren't, you know, they, they, they are all of the markers of this is kind of on the edge. We're going to launch that project anyway, because, because we need to give it a chance. And it's painful. Um, Ian's referring to a, a project that we launched in 2016 um, with Jeff Frost called California on Fire. Um, such an important project beautiful photographs, the people who, you know, people who saw them, 
Jeff had a large social media following and that was a test case for us. Is that audience going to buy books? We know, we know gallery people buy books. We know readers of the New York Times buy books. Like there's certain things that we've seen over time. We didn't know if somebody who was very popular in, you know, I'm a kind of a dinosaur. Like my, I, Insta, I don't know the world of Instagram well. I don't know how those, those, that audience behaves. We didn't know. And we were willing to give it a try. Um, but as it turns out, that audience were quite happy to look at things on screen. And it wasn't important to them to own, to own his work in book form. Um, and so, you know, you only learn that by doing. And I think that's the case where our photographers very much are in it with us. Like it's hard for them. It's difficult to go out publicly and say, be a part of my book, please. <laughs> that's, that's how it's going to happen. Um, it's, it's asking a lot of the photographers. Some people would rather write a check for $30,000 than do that. Michelle, yeah. um, take me through the scenario of, so you, you have a photographer that wants to do a book, okay? And, and now you physically, marketing wise, try to get, um, let's call them investors. People that will give money for the for the book. I call them people who buy books. <laughs> okay. We're not asking people. This is really important, Michael. So thank you for raising that. We're not asking people to do something they would not otherwise be doing. No, that part we're I just, understand. We're just asking them to do it at a different moment in the process. That's fine. I understand that. So, right. so but there's you, a step in between that because. Is there a photographer who doesn't want a book? If there is, I haven't met them. So let's just start with every photographer wants a book, okay? The in-between step is, do they want a book with us? Am I the right person to make that book with them? Because I come out of old school publishing. We have conversations, we talk through, what are these, what is this group of pictures? Why should it be a book? Are you really ready for that? Let's see what else you have. Let's go back and revisit this. Well, right? let, me go so, back, let, let me go back to my questions before you okay. add, <laughs> pile, pile your questions on top of mine. <clears throat> the, the, the issue that I have is, so you're asking people that, want, that will buy books to, let's call it, pre-buy the book, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they pre-buy the book. At what point will you decide whether or not to publish the book or not publish the book? And then to, 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 to finalize the question, what happens to those people that pre-buy the book? Do they get their money back? Yep. Okay. So my, now, my two difference? short answers. Okay. What's the 500. Difference? Let me answer your questions. Okay. Let me answer your question. 500 people or 500 sales, I should say. It doesn't have to be 500 people, 500 sales. At 500 sales, that's a go, no go for us. Okay. And if, if you've pre-purchased a book and the book doesn't move forward, you, you get your money back. Over how, from the time I, I pre-buy the book until the time you decide to go or no go, how much time are you talking about? Maximum six months, usually three. Okay. Um, when you do a book on a per book basis, right? You talked about that before, per book. Am I right? What do you mean by a per book basis? Well, as opposed to say, you're gonna, you're gonna print 500 because you have, you produce a book and uh, on demand, let's call it. Well, that's okay. a different thing on demand printing. No, 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 right. wait, 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 wait. We've wait, only no. done, we did it. You did it once. With I the hard book. book. Yeah. What's the difference between that and the company that, that Dan Milner 
were blurb. before. Blurb. I can there isn't a, a difference. I did that book through Blurb. With Blurb. I produced Charlie's book through Blurb. So I so as the artist, the photographer, I can produce a book myself with Blurb, design everything in it the way I want it, and give it to a company like Blurb to produce it three ways. Either give me, I don't know, 500 books or do it on a per book basis, which is what they do, or give me a CD. So instead of having a book, somebody takes the CD of the book and they store it in their files. Am I right? Yeah, you have all of those options through okay. Blurb. As opposed to having to the feely touchy part of the book and the cover and everything else. Uh, uh, today, <clears throat> today's, today's young readers, young people younger than me, like, like <laughs> I am. all of us. I, well, uh, I, I have to understand Michael Michael still has the Gutenberg press that Gutenberg I, I, absolutely, <laughs> uh, absolutely. I have, I have to ask a line of people out there that want to buy it. <laughs> what, what's uh, a CD? It's it's the replacement for the eight track that you have. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, but but they can they do they can do that on a CD. Now the question that somebody said, well, well who's got a CD? <clears throat> Every, I hate to tell you this, but every every TV set that you purchase today has a slot for a CD. No, it doesn't. No, no, no. none you do. Buying? None you got to stop buying those Phillips. <laughs> the tube. It might have a slot for a USB, yeah. but it yes. doesn't have a slot okay. for a CD. You, you can you can you can do it on a you can do the book on a on a USB. That's Michael, exactly. you know they have color TV now too. <laughs> yeah, but I have the crayons from Art Nagy. So to your point, Michael, one of the things I really like about making books is that it's yeah. a technology that we've understood for over a thousand years. So is cuneiform. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to bring in some questions from the chat, though, to ch keep going here. Um, Jeff was asking if you do ebooks, and do you ever do books with accompanying signed prints? Thanks, Jeff. Those are great questions. Um, we don't. We don't do eBooks. Uh, we haven't seen that there's a huge demand for that. The I did a, the Jim Marshall book that I showed, the Rolling Stones book, um, which was through Chronicle in 2012. That was the, the first time that any, any visual project that I worked on had a kind of significant, I think they might've sold 300 copies of, uh, of it electronically. And it was mostly to an overseas audience of people who wanted to see the content, uh, the content of the book. I, I really care about print. And so doing something for me, doing something on a screen um, would require doing something more than is what I really know how to do. It would require, like if I redid Jeff Dunis's State of the Blues today, I would want to hear, he has audio recordings of all of those musicians, for instance, right? I set beautiful typography in that book because that's in 1998, what we did with audio recordings. Today, I'd want to hear B.B. King talking. So I have ideas around those kinds of things, but I, I actually don't know how to do them. So uh, someday, hopefully someone- I think someone what you're talking about is uh, mixed media, multimedia, uh, when you combine a printed book uh, with a website, uh, with uh, videos, that are posted on YouTube or Vimeo, um, you could actually do, and then the ability to package that with uh, signed prints, um, you know, th that's a bigger project, but um, uh, the one thing can help sell the other. In other words, if somebody hears an interview on a podcast, then they go and look for the book or, you know, they see the, um, um, Facebook or, or uh, Instagram uh, post of the images uh, and then, you know, see a digital version of the book and then they buy the book. Now, you were saying that uh, uh, digital versions, um, and I understand that, that you know, 
I would rather have a printed book than a digital book. And the way in which digital books have been done in the past, the, the fake page folding thing just drives me fucking nuts. Um, <laughs> No, well, I mean, you know, it, it is what it we're is. trying to bring the past into the future. Yeah, um, I, I actually, Jeff, to your point, I think whoever started the 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 ebook um, name, it's kind of a misnomer. Like, what makes a screen interesting is sound and motion, mm -hmm. and and that's what this doesn't have. Yeah. Right. And so. If there's a great filmmaker who someday becomes really interested in like, how do I take what I know how to do and you know how to do and we use the screen for that environment, I'd probably be down for some of that kind of collaboration, but that's really not, um, it's just, it's it's so not my expertise, it's not really where I, my, where I know anything about. And so the ebook world for me is not so much something that I pursue. In terms of limited edition prints, um, that's certainly been, you know, that was uh, that was Aperture's model in the in the 70s. Uh, the prints were kind of a giveaway to get people to buy the books because the prints at that point in time, nobody particularly valued them. There wasn't a huge collecting. It's a kind of funny reversal. Now we're hoping people want the prints and the book, you know, sort of rides along with that. <clears throat> I, I've done those kinds of things. I will say I don't do them through minor matters. I haven't really done them through minor matters. The main reason is, and this came out of being at Chronicle, um, I, uh, I, am, I am of the people by nature. And as things became more expensive in photography, as, as prints started to escalate in price, and for a while books started to escalate and $75 became kind of a norm, it, it made it it made it harder. It made it harder for, for people to, to own them. And, um, and $50 was a price point that felt accessible. It's still, it's, it's been an average price point for a hardcover monograph for 40 years. And so it, it's not that I don't see the value in how those things can work and different publishers have, have used that. Um, but it actually really matters to me that you can you can enter into our process. You can own these books um, at at a relatively accessible price point. How about today in today's in today's marketplace uh, under COVID? I'm sorry. What was that, Michael? <clears throat> Fifty dollars. Right. Today in today's market, with the uh, with COVID and and millions of people out of work, how are book sales and how many bookstores have gone out of business? There's been a huge hit on the bookstores and museum stores, uh, both declining and also being, being closed, right? So a lot of them are not necessarily permanently closed, um, but they are temporarily closed. And therefore that, that was, uh, up to last year was about 30% of our annual revenue was through independent bookstores and museum stores. Um, so we definitely took, took a hit on that uh, in 2020 with those, those places being closed. Um, though 60% of the population is really suffering, 40% of our population right now is not. That's just the truth. There, there is a well, percentage of the American I don't, population. I, I don't know. I, I have a difficult time money. at this. I have a difficult time at this point in, in my life with what's transpired over the last four years, deciding <laughs> what is truth and what is not truth. I can only go with what is, and and the uh, the reality from where I live is that um, nobody's buying anything. Camera companies are have closed down uh, uh, drastically. Some are about to go out of business, literally. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the issue of $50, 50 to buy a book uh, as opposed to paying the mortgage, paying the electricity, paying, paying uh, food on the table, uh, unless you're in the, a bracket of about uh, two or 3%, all right? 
people below that level are really having to uh, either struggle or holding back on making any uh, 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 purchases. That's correct and incorrect. Uh, to Michelle's point. That's, that's my life. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, to Michelle's point, 40% of the population is, is doing quite well. Um, I read a report within the last month that the cargo ships uh, at LA Harbor are backed up tremendously because they cannot unload all of the cargo being brought in to fill the pipeline of online sales fast enough. It, the sales are online are huge. Mm -hmm. People that are in that 40% have not slowed their spending. Yeah, our balance of trade is much worse than it was four or five years ago. We're importing much more now. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, let's take this away from the balance of trade and the business <laughs> end there. I'm going to go back to some more questions. So David Gardner is asking, Michelle, do you take on book projects that are already designed? Sometimes, David. Um, we, we are certainly involved in uh, the shaping of, of the book. That is, that's part of, of what we do. Um, but for instance, uh, Eric Johnson's Pine is, is probably a, a great example. This was something where the photographer had been working, you know, prototyping over, gosh, almost five years. And I'd seen the work, I'd seen the iterations. But by the time he, he and I were at a point where we were going to work together, it was 90% done. He knew what he wanted. He had a format. And so my contributions at that point were relatively minimal in the figuring out the actual executions. Um, the addition of some text, which was important that, that Eric uh, didn't think he wanted and, and the title. So, you know, there's, there's little things. So it's not that, uh, it's not that we have to start something from scratch if people have something that, um, that is a, a working process. Um, India Beale's book started being um, designed in a particular direction and, and we ended up moving in a slightly different direction, but that was at the photographer's request. So yeah, it, vary, it varies a little bit. How does someone pitch a book to you, as Jeff is asking? We, um, we don't take open submissions. And that's part of why we did launch Book Pitch last year. Um, we have not taken open submissions. When I started Minor Matters, I had about 50, a backlog of about 50 projects with photographers that I um, had paid attention to over the years that I was interested in working with. Donna, your name is on there. Um, I saw Donna's series from um, Little Rock many years ago. And, uh, and so there were, you know, there were people that I had met with over time. There were, there were things that, um, that I was interested in and work that I'd seen. There were projects I would tried to get Chronicle to do, or I tried to get Aperture to do that had I not been successful in doing that. So I, I had a pretty long list. Um, and and then, you know, we meet with people over time. So it, I don't want to sound super difficult of the, you know, don't come to us, we'll come to you. But, but that is a part of it. Um, we've recognized that there are people who, you know, really want us to see some of what they're doing. And so we launched Book Pitch as a way to say, we're, we're open to seeing what you're doing and we're going to give you our feedback on that. So it is a fee-based um, submission, but you get a consultation. I, I don't believe in charging you money just for me to look at it. Um, I do that through portfolio reviews. <clears throat> I don't mind you paying other people money. I just don't want you paying me directly just to look at your work. Um, again, I, 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 my job is to serve all of you in making pictures. At the same time, we get, by clearly stating we don't take submissions, we get five to seven a week. Even though it says clearly on our website, we don't take submissions because people are, are hungry to have their books out into the world. And so Book Pitch was the happy medium where if you are willing, if you're willing to spend some money for the time that we're taking, um, then we are willing to give you a thorough evaluation and feedback on you could self-publish this and here's what it will cost you and here's the expertise you'll probably need to hire and here's a rough idea of what that will take and how much time it will take 
you could go to a publisher, here's a recommendation, here's what that will cost you, so that people go into things with, with knowledge. Um, so that's sort of where we, we started with that. So you already mentioned Eric Johnson's pine, but Jake Alexander is asking how you incorporated his record into the project. <laughs> so we had two projects in 2018 that had records. Um, Nicholas Glannon's first book also came with a record. Uh, I think that some of the nostalgia to be off the screen and moving into earlier forms of technology definitely um, has hit the music industry also. And in both of those instances, part of my agreements with the photographers were that they, they would have to deal with the record. I'm not a music publisher. There are completely different laws and licensing and there are totally different issues that have to deal with that. So um, both of those artists took on the production and the publishing of the record and we included the record, but we, it clearly states on the copyright page that the records were produced by a different entity. Um, the logistics for Eric, it was very interesting. Eric really was excited about the record, um, commissioned a lot of people, wanted the record to be very visible. And after a second meeting with the printer, I went home and realized that if we followed through the design the way he had it, um, you would see a quarter of the record the entire time you were looking at the photographs. And I was like, I don't want to look at the record. I want to look at the photographs. Like I came to this book because I love your photographs. And so uh, I called him in a panic and I was like, we can't, we can't do what we just said we were going to do. Sorry. I, we have to, we have to come up with another solution. And, and he was great about it. Um, and so in fact, the record went from being extremely visible to being almost invisible. You kind of have to look at the back and there's a very, it's like probably a quarter of an inch, you can see the edge of the record um, peeking out in the back of the book. Cool. So Stephen Shore is saying, uh, let me just let someone in here. He's found the types of photos are siloed. You seem to be working for fine art photographers who are published or well-known in galleries. What about portrait photographers, personal work, or photojournalists? Do you work with these type of phot photographers who may not be widely known? Portraits, yeah, all portraits. <laughs> Alice Wheeler, all portraits. Um, I, I don't look at just one type of photography, Stephen. Um, but I, I am looking for a couple of different things. I'm looking for who is the person what is their mastery of, of their medium? It's mostly photography that we publish, but we have launched projects with people who work in glass with an oil painter. Um, Nicholas Galanin is, is a mixed media artist. He works in a lot of different ways. So I don't, and Lisa Leone's work, um, Here I Am, is predominantly photojournalistic in, in nature. So it's not so much that we're only interested in um, a category of photography. I am looking at projects that I think are going to resonate over time because if we're going to put it in book form, um, again, that's a technology that you're gonna be able to access a hundred years from now. So is this project gonna speak to who we are now from a hundred years, from the perspective of a hundred years from now? And so th those are, I mean, that, that I know sounds, um, well, who are you to say what should be the history of the future? <laughs> who are any of us to say? You know, you guys are making the work. I'm trying to figure out how to hold it. Um, so that's, you know, that's some of what we're, we're, we're considering. What are the viewpoints? What speaks to what 2020 is about? I went into 2020 thinking it was going to be the year of the woman. It was a hundred, 100th anniversary of the right to vote. Um, perhaps it was going to be a, a scenario where we had a female candidate for president, boy, a lot of things changed from what I thought in early 2019 would be the general tenor of 2020. Definitely global pandemic, not anywhere in my purview, you know? So will we'll, the three books we made by, um, women photographers for two of them first books. Uh, are people gonna make that connection between 2020? I don't know, 
uh, Charlie Harbutt's book really speaks more to the condition of media. And that's a text from 50 years ago. Yeah, that was 1973, I think, originally. Yeah, well, it was uh, 1970 that he gave the speech. Okay. And so it was published first in the, the excerpts in Travelogue were in 1973. And so, you know, a, a text from 50 years ago became the thing that I can point to and say that was 2020 for me was publishing a speech from 1970 <laughs> that really hit at what was occupying a lot of my mind in the past year. So we don't look at just one kind of work, but we are looking, you know, again, we're developing three to five at the most seven projects at any given point in time. So that's a that's a very it's small. Um, it's a very narrow field, and and so we try for variety within that, um, and to find to find a way that we can be choosing projects that have a chance of moving forward. I was not asking because of my work. About <laughs> seven or eight years ago, I joined Professional Photographers of America because I was looking for people to critique my work. And in the Dallas area, yeah. especially, there's an amazingly large number of spectacular photographers. But th those photographers tend not to know the fine art photographers. And the fine art photographers have never heard of any of these people. But their work is spectacular. So I'm, I'm just curious right. you know, how these people can, can get known if they're not known in the fine art world. It's, I mean, you're absolutely right. And at the same time, um, I'll, I'll say to you that being, being at the Palm Springs Photo Festival, mm -hmm. meeting Jim Marshall, I mean, I, I'd been at Aperture for a decade. I didn't know who Jim Marshall was. That was not a name that was familiar to me. But when you start to see, hey, do you know this picture of Johnny Cash? This guy took it. Hey, do you know this picture of Janis Joplin? This guy took it. Hey, mm -hmm. you know that picture of the Beatles? This guy took it, right? And so you know, I agree with you that there are these places where you can become very, very niche and, and not see the broader spectrum. But I think we're also, you know, we're also stuck in a little bit of a place of celebrating that more people are looking at more photographs today and making more photographs today than mm. we ever could have imagined. What right? kind of photographs? All kinds of photographs. Everything. <laughs> That's the problem. Right? Because and we're talking so, about a niche. And, and so billions of, of photographs are being being shown and taken every day. Right. But we're talking about a particular niche. Well, we're talking about affirmation. I think let's like remove books away for a moment. What is it at the end of the day that most people want? It's a sense of like you made something and it spoke to me. Right? And yet we have that, we have that on screen in a way that we never could have had before. There never could have been this many people across the world who could look at a single image of yours, who could even look at an image of yours and have the opportunity to say, this spoke to me, this is interesting, but, some, but, but we're missing something because that's not enough. Right? Photographers are still like, I'd like a book. I'd like an exhibition. I'd like these other things. And so sometimes this feels more like, how do we get at the essence of what is going to make, this is my question to all of you, what is going to make you feel my, like the book that I'm doing is calling Seeing Being Seen. Like the last thing I wanted was to be seen. <laughs> I just wanted to keep seeing. And if I know even when, we, me, when I was publicizing this, you didn't want your face. You showed me pictures of your hands holding books. Exactly. <laughs> like I, 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 I just wanted to be behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. At the same time, my life in photography evolved such that if I didn't step forward and wave the banner for photography, things that I cared about were, were, were disappearing. Curators in museums who were buying photographs if you get rid of the curator of photography, guess what? The number of photographs in that museum declines, right? So if, if someone's not noticing that and pointing it out and speaking to it, that is, that's affecting all of you, whether or not that's something that you're necessarily thinking about. And so those elements 
became like, oh, I'm going to have to give speeches. I'm going to have to be on panels. I'm going to have to step out from behind my cozy spot, looking at pictures in the quiet of the gallery floor and, and talk to people. But my question to all of you is we exist in a world now when in theory, it should be the best thing you've ever wanted. You can show your pictures to the whole world. And someone from across the world can say, good job. So how do we get more nuanced in really talking about what it is you desire? because that part's been achieved. And so what does it mean to have an exhibition? What does it mean to have a book? Why? On a sort of basic level. And then who's investing in that? We know you're invested. We know some, we know I'm invested, but like, and when I say invest, I don't just mean money. I mean time and space and like who, how when do we build that ecosystem up to best support so that you feel good about what you're doing? When you say a book and a gallery show, what, are, what exactly do you mean? I mean, a, a physical book and a, a brick and mortar gallery? I'm asking you. I'm asking you back. <laughs> well, so like, I'm gonna turn, like this is how I live, right? There's books behind me. There's prints right next to the books. If I keep turning this around, you're just going to see a repetition of more books and more prints and more books and more prints. That's how I live. Do Is our ultimate goal that everyone in the world lives with more books and prints? Is it we want there to be spaces that we can visit? that are filled with books and prints? Is it that we're content to experience them online? I, I, for me personally, I don't like looking at photographs online. As much as I would love to do some reviews online, I don't love it as much as I love sitting with a human being holding a print. But if that's the only way that you could do it, you would you would forgive it and and not not do it at all. I, that's a really good question, Michael, and I'm wrestling with that. I am wrestling with how I publish books by photographers whose prints I have not seen because I lost eight experiences at a minimum to see photographic objects in 2020. I go out into the world and I look at things. That is what I do. That is a major part of my life experience. And I didn't, I, I didn't do that in 2020. So I don't, I, I, it's something that I'm wrestling with. I have enough for 2021. I'm, I'm good. Probably even into the beginning of 2022. But when I start thinking about the fall of 2023 and I may be halfway through 2021 and not ever see a, an object, I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what that means. I'm, I'm in the midst of wrestling with doesn't that. Doesn't forewarn uh, um, uh, what's the expression? Forewarned is forearmed. And do you really think that 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 it's gonna this whole thing is gonna disappear by magic? Not. Oh. I'm saying that um, by the fall of 2023. Maybe I'll be doing an online magazine because I won't have seen enough work to warrant making printed books for two years. Talking about seeing things, uh, Suzette was asking if there's a way to see the contents of the books that are in a pre-sales 
situation before yeah, we buying? Do, we do six or eight spreads um, on our website. We do a cover uh, with specifications and six to eight spreads. And that comes out of, again, my background in, in traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. When people were selling, when sales reps were selling to bookstores, they, they saw a catalog page. They saw a cover, a couple paragraphs, a couple images, and people made the decision of like, yes, we'll take this into the bookstore. No, no, we won't. So we really use that as our model. We don't, we don't show the entire book. Um, we will sometimes show it to press if they're going to do a major feature. Um, but for the most part, we, we pull out a selection of, of images. And so you can see that for, for books on our website, you can see a selection of images um, oh. as well as the specifications, text, bios for anyone who's mm -hmm. writing for the book. I put a link to your book in there in the chat. And Jeff was asking if you, when it does get published, if you can get a signed copy, being you already bought it. I would be happy to sign a copy for you, Jeff. <laughs> I can rarely, rarely offer that from my authors, but given as I'm <laughs> the one schlepping them from the warehouse to the post office. I can... Having seen many a photographer self-publish a book and proving without question they are not book designers or graphic artists, can I uh, <laughs> assume that that is the role that you uh, take over when somebody comes to you uh, or when you start putting together a book? And how do you decide about size and format? Those are great questions, Ian. Um, yes, I design all of the Minor Matters books. I don't feel uh, proprietary about being the designer of all the, the books. Thus far, that's been a, that's been a financial uh, reality. So I, it's a skill set that I bring, I bring to the table and uh, I think as things continue to progress, there will be circumstances where I may hire a designer to um, to work on a particular project. I may be hiring a designer to work on my project. I, I might I might need a little feedback on that. Um, and so that you know that's definitely something that's part of the process. I I really um, pride myself on seeing each book as unique and individual and working out the trim size of the book, the page count for what is right for that project. Um, so while we have a fixed uh, retail price point that stays the same, the, there is no formula for the end results. We do do hardcover books for the most part, again, because I'm thinking about that long-term uh, durability. I want, this to, I want this to stick around for 150 years and, and hardcover books are just more durable. Um, sometimes they're cloth, sometimes they're paper covers, sometimes they're jackets. Those have to do with the book and the work. And if the photographer feels strongly about having a book jacket, um, some of them do, some of them don't. Some of them, you know, have particular ideas around that. And so I work closely with the photographers on, on the design. Um, but I, I work out the physical size of the book much the way that we did at Aperture, which is to look at the photographs. <laughs> this feels like it should be big. This feels like it's intimate. You know, it's, um, we try we try different things, and and of course the photographers also have viewpoints. Um, some of them come to the table with like, I really strongly see this as a portrait book, or I really, you know, portrait scale, or I really strongly see this in a landscape format. And I'll always try that, but I will also go back to them and say, I tried it your way, but would you mind looking at this? Cause something really interesting is happening when, when we're trying it in this other way. So it's a pretty collaborative um, iterative experience. Uh, to work out what those basic specifications will be. Do you have an average minimum uh, of page count? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think 72 pages is probably the shortest book we've ever done. And the book we did a book that was 80 pages, a book that was 72 pages. Uh, I printed it on really heavy paper so that it would bulk up and feel, you know, I mean, you also have to remember, like, I, we're selling books that people haven't seen, right? 
So there is a customer service component of you've been waiting for this thing that you bought sometimes for up to a year if there's a six month presale and then there's a production process after that. So, so you're now getting something in the mail that you've never held that you spent with shipping and tax $60 on, right? So I very much bear in mind that we need to be delivering you something that, um, that feels like a $50 book. And hopefully it feels like more than $50 and you're so excited that you got to own it for only $50. Um, so that's really the biggest consideration, you know, that we, that we bear in mind. If people are buying the book internationally, it's a hundred dollars, it's a hundred us dollars by the time it's shipped to them. And so one of the things that has been um, really a, a humbling point for me is that we've never had someone say, actually, this doesn't, this, this doesn't feel good. I don't feel like I got my money's worth. Like in seven years, we've never had someone say, this didn't feel good. And I regret spending $50. So I, I feel really good about that. So I'm going to take this a little slightly different direction. You mentioned a garage before. I'm just going to share a photo here. <laughs> My baby. So tell us about Seriously? this. Seriously? Wow. <laughs> that is my 1950 Studebaker Champion. It's been mine since I was nine. It did not look like this when I was nine. Um, my father, I grew up with 26 cars. My father restored cars as a hobby. He drove about eight of them on a regular basis. And so there were 19, 18 or so that were in dusty states of disrepair. This was one of them. And uh, I fell in love with it. And I was afraid that nobody would love it as much as I did. So I asked my dad uh, if I could have it. My brother and sister tended to ask for the cars that were running which was a 59 Caddy and a 59 uh, Ford hardtop retractable, 1968 Camaro, Lincoln Continental. Uh, my father's, uh, the, love, the, love, the love of his car life was a 1955 Austin Healey. So uh, they always wanted the cars that ran. I wanted the car that didn't run. And at one point in time, many points in time, in fact, everything I've owned in life uh, sat inside that car. Uh, I got it on the road in 2008, so it has been running. Uh, it has been running consistently since then. Very nice. <laughs> so, are there other questions in the audience? We've been going for an hour and a half, or even a little more than that. <laughs> this has been really Michelle. interesting. Um, Michelle, you might. Might be a little interest, interested in a little history. Before I moved to Dallas in 1980, I was at a um, at a forum, and on a panel discussion, one of the people speaking was the other Stephen Shore. And my, my background is, is as a photo optical engineer, so I never saw him as a competitor. I just found it interesting we had the same name. And so after the presentation, I went up and introduced myself because I thought it was kind of humorous. He saw no humor in it whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> it was like. Like I had said, you're sitting in a chair. And he's like, yeah, right. So what? St Stephen is a little dead <laughs> Um Yes. When well, I, I have a Stephen Shore story for you. Okay. Stephen was uh, the first person that agreed to be a part of what became this like crazy rollicking five-day lecture series that we ran, that Aperture mm -hmm. ran for five years on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And Stephen was the first person who said yes, uh, largely because I used to feed their goats and babysit his kid. You know, I mean, that was, <laughs> um, and we get to LA. I never produced a public program like this. I don't really mm -hmm. know what to ex expect. There were 300 people in the auditorium. There were another 200 people in an overflow room. Like it was a huge audience. Mm -hmm. And I realize as Steven's about to go on stage, that I've never heard this man speak about photography. I've heard him speak about fly fishing. I've heard him speak about <laughs> baseball. I've heard him speak about goats and cats and his wife and how much he loves his kid and all of these other things. And I'm standing there like, oh my God, 
what if he gets up and starts talking about fly fishing? Like I didn't specify he needed to talk about photography. I just asked if he would give a talk. And so I was in the back room having heart failure. He gave a lovely talk uh, and he showed his photographs. But I said to him after, I mean, it was a huge lesson. Like mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't know, you know? And after that, I was like, oh, note to self, ask photographers what they're going to talk about. Um, but I, I said, you know, I, I was a little nervous because I realized you, I've never actually spoken to you about photography. He, he didn't like to talk about photography when he was at a faculty barbecue or anything like that. So, and he laughed and he said, well, I have taught for 20 years. So I, you know, I, I know what I'm supposed to do in these environments, but yeah, it was a, it, it was a learning lesson for sure. Well, I, have one I, more I went to, I went to undergraduate school at RIT and taught at RIT. And by the time I had, had met him that one time, he and I actually had a, a lot of friends in common who were photographers. That just, that didn't make any difference to him. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got one more question from Jim saying, audience finding is such a strange and surprisingly challenging process. What have you learned in all of this? What has just surprised you? Um, the international interest definitely surprised us. Um, and what we've learned is that people really need to hear from at least three different sources. So we're, we, Minor Matters, we're one source. The photographer is a second source. Um, but they really actually need to hear from a third source in addition to hearing from us and from the photographer. So whether that's John telling his friends, hey, I bought this book and I think it's cool, you should buy it too, or it's a press article, or it's a feature on a blog, or it's, it's Doug King saying, I studied with Jenny Riffle and I really like her. I bought her book, please consider buying her book also. Like what it, whatever that third voice is, but people need to hear from, from three different sources and they need to hear multiple times. It, it's, there are the people who right away, they see something, they're like, wow, this is cool. I'm gonna buy it. Um, a lot of ph photographers go in thinking like, oh, this is great. I'll, you know, I'll put it in my newsletter. I'll post it on Facebook. I'll post it on Instagram and we'll be done. And it, it just doesn't work that way. You know, it's, it's, it's hand selling. Uh, my father was a salesman uh, for a reference book publishing company. And he taught me a lot about sales and persistence is an important part of it. You just, you, you just have to go in knowing you're going to have to ask people um, and encourage people and invite people and cajole people. Um, and basically until they say no, that's a potential yes out there waiting to happen, so. Great. Well, I'm gonna be back again on Thursday with Teresa Mayer, uh, or is it Meyer? I actually never asked you how you pronounce your name, Teresa. Are you out there? <laughs> You're muted. Hey. Hi, <laughs> uh, it is Meyer. Thank Meyer, you. okay. Yep. Great. So does anyone else have any last questions or comments for Michelle? Or Michelle, do you have any final statement you want to make today? This was wonderful. Um, I'm sorry, I was not looking at the chat simultaneous. I'll, I'll send you a copy of the chat. To do that. But if people have other questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, want to try and, and provide as much information as we can related to publishing. John, thank you very much for inviting thank me. You. Um, to be a part of this today, Martin Luther King Day, um, acts of service for those of you in America. So, you know, pick, pick one thing, pick one thing to do that, that is good for photography, is good for you, is good for your community. Thank you for being well, here. Thank you all. This has thank, been great. You. thank you. Thank you for speaking, joining us. Oh, it was my pleasure. Buy books, buy more books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here. Thank I, you. I got a few books thank behind you. me too. So all be well. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, John. Thank you.